Psalms chapter 5, to the chief musician upon Nilio, a psalm of David. Now, Nilio means inheritance. It's not a musical instrument. Give ear to my words. Now, David said in chapter 4, Lord, hear me. Consider my meditation prayer. And there are things in life that, again, we talked about in chapter 4. It's not that we believe God's not listening to us, but there are things in our life we believe are priorities. And we want God to pay attention. We want God to hear. We, God want, we want God to know it's important to us. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King, that's Jesus, and my God. Well, that's kind of interesting. Because the King, capital K, is Jesus. I got to make that note there. I just saw that. My notes. And make my notes here. The King is Jesus. Revelation says Jesus Christ is the King of the kings and Lord of lords and my God. You find that thing in Titus 2.13 and that and is the syntax. It's together. The King, capital K, and the God, capital G, are one in one. So to believe that Jesus is not God is just a an heresy. And unto thee will I pray. Unto who? The King and the God. Now, Jesus is the king to the Jewish people. He's not king of the church. He's the groom. He's the savior. He's a shepherd. But he's never king of the church. And even Pilate nailed on the cross the king of the Jews. My voice shall thou hear in the morning. So what's one of the things we should do in the morning? We should pray to God and talk to God. Oh, Lord, in the morning, if you didn't get it the first time, I will direct my prayer if you didn't get it the first time. Unto thee and will look up. So this is not a, a, a humble prayer like the man that, that, that bowed his knee and wouldn't look to heaven and smoke his chest. Lord God, forgive me to be a sinner. Which Jesus said, he's right and we ought to do that. This is a prayer we look to God and say, God, you're wonderful, you're great, marvelous. Thank you for a brand new day. Let's go out and do it in the name of the glory of God our Father. Help me not to sin. Help me to do right today, Lord. Start off your day in prayer, looking up to God. So we don't look to heaven in prayer, and we look to heaven in prayer. For thou art not a God, here we go, God. That has pleasure in wickedness. Oh, I'm a sinner. I just, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a Christian. I just sin. God loves us for our sins. God has no pleasure in the wickedness. And so when you got sodomites running around with saying, God loves us too. Look how, no, you're wicked. You're an abomination. And the Bible says God has no pleasure with you. So shut up. Do yourself a favor. Turn off the TV with that nonsense. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. That's heaven. God dwells in heaven. So when we get to heaven, we dwell with God. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, or the rapture. And then when we go on to New Jerusalem, where we dwell where God and, and the Son is the Lamb, there will be, according to that verse, no more evil. Now, what about Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2 when the devil shows up to God? What about Revelation 12? It says the accuser of the brethren. What about that? Is not the devil evil? Yes, he is. But does he dwell in heaven? Absolutely not. We will see him in heaven unto Revelation 12 when Michael and his archangels cast him out of heaven. But he don't dwell there. We're not going to find a home and an abode where Satan has a place in heaven. He, he doesn't live there no more. He just comes and visits. Unto Revelation 12. 
He will dwell in the lake of fire that burns forever in eternity. So he's not going to be there in heaven. Well, what if the devil goes out? What if he becomes a new Jerusalem? Evil will not dwell with God. The foolish, so you've got the wicked and the evil, the foolish shall not stand in thy sight. And David's got fear and say, listen, Lord, I pray in the morning. I reach out to you in the morning. Lord, I, I, consider me. And David's saying, listen, that fool, he's not in the presence of God, even if he prays. And then again, at the judgment. Judgment seat of Christ or the, the, uh, the great white throne judgment, either the foolish in his folly has no standing with God. God is not going to reward the folly of a fool. Thou hatest. Uh-oh, God hates. But that's not the liberal God. God hates all workers of iniquity. What do you do with that verse there? When God hates something. There it is. Are you involved in the work of iniquity? God hates it. And when we come to um, Proverbs later, we'll find out there's seven things, eight, that God hates more. Thou shalt, God shalt, destroy them that speak least. And we saw that verse the other night in chapter 4, verse 2. That's not renting. That's people who have a falsehood. If you are involved in any falsehood, false witness, false prophet, any false, oh, excuse me, my nose itching, any false, God says, I'll destroy it. Well, that salesman lied to me. He had a false report. God will destroy it. Politicians have a false atmosphere about it. God will destroy it. But there are false po prophets in the pulpit. God will destroy it. The Lord will abhor, hate, again, hate, the bloody murderers and the deceitful man. Anybody that works deceit, anybody who tries to get advantage of somebody else, God says, I abhor it through David. The inspiration of the Holy Spirit through David. And we know that David speaks to the Holy Spirit because Jesus said that David spoke through the Holy Spirit. Now you take what we just read, verses five and six, to the liberal Christian, to the to the you know the church that everybody is welcome, and we just love the world. The world just loves us. They wouldn't. That would not be tolerated in the pulpits. If you want to ruin a bunch of angry, uh, yeah, no, let me take that. If you want to make angry and ruin the day of people coming out of the church Sunday morning, stand on their sidewalk and preach Psalm chapter 5, verse 5 and 6. You will ruin their day. You will make them angry. And there's nothing more to find out how well a religious man loves God when you step on their toes and give them the proper gospel. And I know that. But as for me, so David's saying he's not wicked, he's not evil, he's not foolish, he's not iniquity, he's not involved with leasing, he's not bloody, and he's not deceitful. This is the same man who's going to take a walk one day on his rooftop, and he's going to fall into adultery, he's going to fall into murder. And God will forgive him. Because his heart is right with God. He had a contrite heart. These people, verses 5 and 6, they don't want to get right. They hate God. And God hates them. How can God hate? God's only going to return. Be not mocked. God's not deceived. Whatsoever man soweth, that he shall also reap. You want to hate God? God will hate you. You love God and you do some things that God doesn't like. And yet, man, you're battling. You hate them sins. The Bible says hate those sins. And you're battling. God will give you help. God will help you. But if you enjoy your sin and don't want to have anything to do with God and anything with the word of God, God hates you. You get what you want. And you get what you give to God. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. 
There are a bunch of tents out there. Remember, the, the, the temple is not built. David said one point, I looked out the window, I saw the Lord's laying a bunch of tents, curtains. I'm in a wall of cedar. That's something wrong with that. And in thy fear, he feared God, will I worship toward thy holy temple? So, that bunch of tents, that bunch of curtains, David said, that's holy because that's where God is. Now, that's where God dwells. I got to call the question when you got churches all around the world that call themselves the blankety blank temple. The temple of the blankety blank. And I'm not saying blankety blank as lies or, or cussing. I'm saying they call this a, their church building's name has temple in it. You can't find that in the New Testament. And the only New Testament uh, thing that you find for the church age, the temple, is the body of believers, not the nails, the wood, the bricks, the stone, the windows, and the doors. What are you doing when you call your, your building a temple where God says, all right, there's a holy temple there where God dwells, or there's a bunch of believers. The believers are not the wood and the stones and the nails. Are you trying to say that God dwells in your building? That where God is is in your temple? I don't believe it. <clears throat> Not especially maybe some temples, and I don't know. Maybe some have a perverted Bible. I believe there's one Bible as much as there's one Jesus, one God, one Holy Spirit, one salvation. The Holy Temple. And that wasn't a church building that David went to. That was a place set off for the Jewish people where God said, I will meet for, I will meet you from between the cherubims where no Jew went but the high priest, but once a year, twice, and not without blood. Lead, lead me, guide me, set me forth, Lord. O oh Lord, in thy righteousness, because of my enemies. Lord God, tell me where to go. Direct me in what is right. Because of my enemies, because those that are against me, against you, Lord, make thy way straight before my face. Now look at the Lord Jesus Christ there. Jesus is the righteousness of God. He has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. My righteousness is Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God is Jesus Christ. And look what he says. Thy way. What is thy way? Jesus said, I am the way. And that way is the only way to the Father, he says. I can't find Jesus in the scriptures. You're not looking. You're not looking. You're not studying. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Who? The enemy. The enemy is of David. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their insides, their guts, they're, they're all in all. They're just plain wicked inside and out. Jesus said, and, and Luke, you guys are whited sepulchers and inside you're full of dead man's bones. I feel like the Lord was quoting David there. You're just dead inside. Wickedness is dead. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Well, that's kind of interesting because let's go back over here to Luke. Let's follow what Jesus told them. Luke chapter. Let's see if I can find it. Probably not. Luke chapter 11. Verse 44. Let me write this reference here. Oh, I do I have Psalm 5, 9 there. Somebody showed me that reference. Luke 11, 44. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, the religious people, hypocrites. 
That's what I told that guy at the Catholic Church the other night. And that guy said, I'm glad you call me a Pharisee. For ye are as graves, which appear not. And the men that walk over them are not aware of them. You're dead. You're dead. You're dead. Graves. Graves are not live people. And there's another place that Jesus said, I don't know where it is, but he said, you're as sepulchers. You're that you're that that big nice building in the cemetery, and inside that nice big building is dead man's bones and ashes and everything. You're dead. Dead. Their throat is an open sepulcher, speaks dead things. They're flatter with a tongue. It's not good. David, destroy them, destroy thou them, O God. What's the difference between the Old Testament, the Gospels, and the New Testament? David says, destroy him, Lord. Jesus said, love thine enemies. That was something odd and new for the Jewish people. They hated the Gentiles. Just go ask Peter and go ask Jonah. Jonah, I want you to go over there. I want you to tell those, those Ninevites. I want you to tell them to repent and get right. Because the city is going to get destroyed. I'm that way, Lord. The other way. Peter, I want you to go over to that Italian's house. I want... Yeah, right, Lord. You know what? Jesus shows up on the scene. You know what one of the things he tells you? He says, you know all the things that David said about the enemy? Kill him, the Lord. Destroy him. You know? You know? He, says, no. he says, love your enemies. Help them. That was foreign to the Jews when Jesus taught those things. Destroy them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. And they would die and go to hell. We're, in a, uh, we're looking forward to the cross. David's not looking forward to the cross. Lord, kill them. And they're going to go to hell. That's what, what happened when God kills them. Let them fall by their own counsel. You know, let them, when they get together and have a meeting, let their meeting destroy themselves. Cast them out of the, it cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions. Let them die in their sins. That's what he's saying. For they have rebelled against thee. True. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Those who do do right. Verse 10 is those who don't love God. And verse 11, those who do love God. Now, if we had that atmosphere today as Dave in 10, 11, the enemies of God would be like, we'll sit in church. All right, we're going to go visitation or we're going to go pass out. To hell with them. Let them go to hell. They won't come in our church. They don't want to come and sit and listen to our preacher preach. To hell with them. Let them die. That's the attitude. And a lot of Christians have that attitude when they don't witness and they don't tell them about Jesus Christ. Whether they fear the people, fear their family, they just don't care. Listen, I go out and tell people about Jesus because I don't want them to go to hell. Even though they cuss me out, they, 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 they ridicule the Lord, they hate God, I still, Lord God. There's one man, you know, he tries to stop the ministry at where we go at the, at the farm. I pray for that guy's soul. That's loving your neighbor. And John, as we read today, in John, in uh, second, well, actually, first, First John, Second John, and Third John. You're supposed to love them. But let those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Amen. Glory to God. Let them ever shout for joy. We're going to do that in heaven one day. Because thou hast defended them. And talking about the nation of Israel. And this is, would be a second advent passage. When the enemies are put down. Chapter uh, Verse 10. The Antichrist in the world that's against the Jew. <coughs> Remember, the enemies of Israel, God said, I will curse them that curse you. And that still goes forth today. 
That will go forth in the tribulation period. So David's right, man. God, if they curse us, the Jews, you curse them. That's biblical. That's right. Today, Jesus said, love your enemies. John said, love your enemies. Love the brethren. There are people, all right, you know, I get more along with the enemies in the world, and I'll have an attitude with the problem with the people in church. That's wrong. But the, the enemies in verse 10, notice 10, Gentile number. When, when Jesus comes and separates the goats from the sheep, the sheep are left, verse 11, rejoicing with who? The king is in Jerusalem. The people of Israel are in their land. Those that are saved that got the inheritance and reward, they are reigning in cities in charge. The curse is removed off the earth. There is celebration. There is this great happiness all through the land because Jesus is there. There it is. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous. Yes, he will. Make happy. And favor wilt thou compass him as with a shield, a defense. So we see here, we see the description of a saved man, Old Testament. He's right with God. We see a picture of men that are not right with God. We see the enemy of God being put away because they're the enemies of Israel. And we see Israel rejoicing and blessing when Jesus comes, the king. 